Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Turner, and I'd like to welcome you all to our third green tea chat. Um, it's part of the China Environment Forum new webinar series that, um, and I've been I've been at the Wilson Center for 21 years, and a good hunk of that has been focused on U.S. China clean energy and climate cooperation or competition. Depends what the what the energy is like that year. And I'm really happy today to have my friend Kelly Sims Gallagher who is academic dean and a professor of energy and environmental policy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Very long title there, Kelly. Um, she's gonna be drawing on not only her, her research work on climate and, and tech innovation, but also her time when she was in the Obama administration, kind of, a, I don't know, doing the climate wrestling negotiations back in the day in uh, 2014 and around those times. Um, and so we're gonna be talking today about the, kind of the trajectory or rocky road of US and China climate cooperation as we move forward. Hi, hey, Kelly, thanks for coming. Great to be here. Yeah, and so I think that um, we're just gonna dive right in. Um, about 10 days ago, US and China signed a joint statement on the climate crises. And one area that they highlighted in there made me think of you because it was green and low carbon transportation. Now, when I met you, I think back in 2002, you were still slaving away on your dissertation. And, um, and that focused on US uh, automotive companies tech transfer to China. And you later wrote a book called China Shifts Gears that was focusing on you know, the, how the automakers and the pollution and the climate impact of this kind of trade. So I want to ask you, it's not a quiz, it's just a question about cars, clean cars. Uh, that, that, that's what we've seen trends both in the US and China of wanting to move that direction. Now, first question, easy, I think. Were you surprised when Xi Jinping announced in 2020 that China was going to move away from internal combustion engine cars and by 2035 you won't be able to buy one and it's going to be EVs or new energy vehicles. Were you surprised? Were you saying like I was I not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Why I wouldn't, were you not surprised? Certainly didn't uh, predict it but uh, China made a very strategic decision some time ago to try to leapfrog so to speak to uh, what they call in China new energy vehicles, uh, what we call electric vehicles. And I think their logic uh, was pretty simple uh, from an energy security point of view, um, relying on electricity for fuel for, for motor vehicles is a way for China to be more energy secure. And from an air pollution point of view, it was a way to reduce urban air pollution um, to switch to electric vehicles. And of course, from a climate change point of view, as China shifts the proportion of its electricity that's generated from coal to renewables, which it is working on doing, um, it it continue, you know, it will it will get better and better in terms of the the climate benefit. And there was another factor which I I identified, you know, early, which was that China had a very hard time accessing the patents. Uh, for hybrid vehicles. And as a result, China essentially abandoned the effort to adopt a hybrid vehicle sort of technology pathway and decided to just go straight to electric vehicles. So I think there were at least these four reasons why China decided to go electric and they have been determined um, in their in their efforts, um, both in, on the innovation side and in terms of deployment of electric vehicle charging stations and subsidizing, you know, purchases of electric vehicles as well. So here's the follow up to that. So can China do with electric vehicles like they did with solar panels? I mean, are they going to completely change the energy landscape? I mean, China, you know, I mean, they, they, they've, there was a reason that solar panels are so cheap today. I mean. Again, another book you wrote. I would you write so many books. It's insane. You wrote one about the global diffusion of clean energy technologies and looking at China. Um, is this is this is this what's going to happen? That China is going to be the leader of the global green shift, which which is important because we need these technologies to to make climate change action happen. What do you think? Can they do it? Well, I think um, more generally, if we think of all clean energy technologies ranging from renewables to energy storage technology, ultra high voltage transmission, um, all of these different types of um, clean energy technologies that the Chinese government has been investing in significantly um, for many years, they've slowly but steadily 
and continuously ramped up their investments. And actually, according to the latest year available, um, Chinese government not including the state-owned enterprises, um, clean energy investments in our D and D research, development, and demonstration actually exceeded U.S. investments. Um, uh, you know, in 2018, which is our latest year. Um, now, if you include nuclear, U.S. investments exceed China's. Um, and if you include China's state-owned enterprises, which are still heavily dominated by fossil fuels, um, they're still investing in a lot of R&D and fossil. But, but really, I think the thing to realize is that the Chinese government is now outspending the U.S. government in you know, clean energy, our d, &D. Um, So there's just been a tremendous effort that they've made. And what China has also done is um, uh, invest in what I call market formation policy. So trying to create the markets at home and of course serve markets overseas uh, to um, incentivize manufacturers to produce and sell. Um, so China had for, for wind and solar, a very robust feed and tariff system that created you know, a lot of demand for wind and solar within China. Um, and indeed, you know, China's building more wind and solar than any other country on earth. Um, 78 gigawatts last year. But, but then they also did what I call solar power Darwinism, where about a little over a year ago, they pulled the plug and say, survival of the fittest baby. And then we had like, and we've had like half the solar PV companies just disappear in the past two years in China. In, so. Inside. Well, you know, what happens is with their market formation policy, they create a lot of demand uh, in the marketplace for these technologies. And then you get um, so many manufacturers, you know, it's almost like a repetitive or redundant um, manufacturing supply. Um, and this has happened repeatedly in China, particularly with, with solar and, um, it has been perceived in other countries as dumping, right? Because you get so much excess supply that prices plunge um, and uh, uh, it's good for consumers, uh, but it's really a rough competitive uh, supply, supplier marketplace. So, so, you, so it's not, it's not cheating, they're, but it just, it's just how they're doing it. And so they're, they're repeating this with, with EVs now as well, this big investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's much harder uh, to manufacture an electric vehicle. Um, it's uh, not, not at all the same process as a solar PV panel. Um, so I think to have, um, you know, high quality electric vehicles is a capability that's difficult for many companies. So we haven't seen as much repetitive production capacity Okay. In, that, in that regard. All right, let's kind of shift it. Not that, okay, now the next question is, I'm not asking you to be the Kelly report card, but um, on climate, but um, <laughs> I want to ask you about like, you know, how has, you know, the US and China, how have we been doing in terms mm -hmm. of meeting our Paris commitments? We both countries have set carbon neutrality goals. Um, I mean, I've heard other experts and you've said too, that, that China is going to meet their Paris commitment, uh, but now they're building more coal-fired power plants. Are you yeah. Are they slipping behind? And are we also, we had four years of uh, not prioritizing it at the national level. Are we also slipping back as well? What's your Yeah. So, so China had four dimensions to its original commitment under the Paris Agreement. Um, there was this commitment to peak its emissions um, no later than 2030. And they said they would make best efforts to peak early. They made a commitment in terms of the proportion of non-fossil energy, 20% non-fossil energy as a percentage of primary energy supply. They had a forestry commitment. Um, what was the fourth one? Uh, it'll come to me. Um, whereas the US just had an emissions, an absolute emissions reduction commitment, which was 26 to 28% below 2005 levels. Oh yeah, China's other one was a carbon intensity um, commitment. So in the Chinese case, we've got these four different metrics we can look at. 
um, and uh, they're well ahead of schedule in terms of their carbon intensity commitments. So actually China recently in December, it, it increased, um, it made more stringent its carbon intensity commitment um, they're also well ahead of their forestry commitment. And so they made that a little bit stronger. Um, they have not moved forward their peaking date, which I think many people were hoping that they would do. Um, but they have reiterated their intention to, you know, make um, best efforts to peak early. Uh, and I think the one area which is going to be challenging for China is the um, non-fossil target. Um, and it's particularly challenging because as you noted, um, there are still some new coal plants being built in China. Um, and in, in 2020, we saw a little mini resurgence um, of new coal-fired power. And I think that reflects the political economy of coal in the Chinese context. <laughs> Right, you've just got a huge number of jobs. There's miners, uh, there's coal-fired power plant companies and electricity companies. Uh, there are towns, just like in the United States, there are towns, there are provinces that depend so much on this industry. And so in times of economic hardship, the traditional response has been to invest in more coal-fired power plants to boost you know, production and, and save jobs in these, in these regions. And I think that's what we're seeing in the Chinese case. But isn't there, there's also still some slippage that we say in terms of the incentives for, for energy, because I've, I remember reading that, that, um, that when, when wind power comes from farms far afield, the provinces actually can't tax that. So there's also, there's the potential tax revenue from taxing local coal. So th there's a little yes, bit. Yes, yeah. And I think there's another factor, which is the dispatch of, mm -hmm. so who, de depending on who's controlling the grid in, in what region, they, the, they are more likely to dis, you know, in the coal regions, they're more likely to dispatch the coal first um, because they want to achieve sales for the coal fire power plants. Um, even though they're supposed to dispatch the renewables first, according to the renewable energy law. So a little slippage on the implementation there. So yeah, on that one. So, but what about in, in, in the U S um, yeah. So then on the U S side, um, well, I mean, frankly, the U S got off track, um, during the, the Trump administration, um, you know, there were a number of policies that the Obama administration had put in place as part of the um, climate change action plan. And um, those included, you know, fuel efficiency standards for light duty vehicles, medium duty vehicles, heavy duty vehicles, um, phasing down um, some of the non CO2 gases um, under the SNAP program, the Significant New Alternatives Program managed by EPA, um, efficiency standards. And of course, the big one uh, was going to be the clean power plan. And um, during the Trump administration, uh, almost all of those regulations were either challenged in the courts or reversed. Um, and while many of them, I think, eventually prevailed in the courts, the implementation of these regulations were slowed down. Um, and so we essentially lost ground for four years. Um, the good news, though, is that the marketplace was helping uh, America <laughs> achieve its goals in the sense that, as, as you noted before, the costs of wind and solar have come way down. And so there's been very rapid construction of new wind and solar farms uh, in the United States. Um, coal is sort of naturally disappearing uh, from the marketplace because it isn't cost competitive anymore. Um, and then there was a lot of act activity and act policy action at the state level. So for all of those reasons, we're not terribly off track, but we are off track. And it will take a lot of work to get back on track, much less to enhance ambition as President Biden just committed to with his 50 to 52% reduction target yeah. by 2030. 
I, it, it, this kind of reminds me of this, this, I feel like that in one hand that we're kind of back, I traveled back in time, the cooperative competitors kind of attitude, like, it, and, it, and, and in that time back on the Obama administration, it wasn't just uh, um, climate, there was also like on, on wildlife trade. Do you remember how there was the story that, that one day the US burnt like, I don't know, 61 tons of, of ivory and the next day the Chinese burnt 62. Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> so, so there's kind of this race to, yeah, but it's just because I've just noticed this across that the, the little bit of this, you know, attempt, you know, back then, the idea of racing to the top. Um, but, but, but you mentioned something about the local governments, the state governments in the US. And I know that, you know, you know, the, the country of California, right? California has, you know, they have an agreement with China that they brokered during, mm -hmm. um, during the Trump administration. And, and you know, there, there's other state to province kind of cooperation. Do you think that that's going to also will that kind of do you think that's going to restart to be an area where there can be real cooperation again? I mean, it's going to take we're still kind of a rocky road with us coming together like we did in, under the Obama administration. The political context has totally changed. Um, you know, when we look back at, at the 2014 era, you know, the tensions between the U.S. and China were not nearly as pronounced as they are today. We hadn't just had a trade war. Uh, there wasn't nearly as much concern in terms of relative military might. Um, and uh, the human rights issues were not such an aggravating factor. You know, everything that's happened in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, you know, had not happened. Um, so I think that, you know, certainly at the national level, it's going to be very difficult to actually cooperate right now. Um, but, but, that's not to say it isn't um, as important as ever to coordinate, to engage in dialogue, to understand what each country is doing, make sure there's no misperception, um, and even, you know, uh, uh, conspiracy theories that start to develop <laughs> due to lack of um, yeah. clarity about what's happening in each country. Um, but I think at the state level, it's just a little bit easier that the tensions aren't quite so um, pronounced. And <clears throat> so I, I think there is potential for state to province cooperation. Okay. Well, there's, well, let me, let's go to, let's, let's return to that joint statement that had a nice little list of things that again, it was, it wasn't like a full on big bear hug between the US and China in this agreement saying kind of like you said, like maybe, I don't know, like parallel play, parallel work kind of stuff. And one, one of the, I'm sorry, thinking back of toddler time with my own job. But so, you know, besides the electric via, you know, the low carbon vehicles, they, they do talk about um, helping other developing countries decarbonize. And so that would be green financing. And so when we look at China and you and everyone, a lot of people on this on the, that are watching today and hey, people watching, you can you can tweet or email in questions for Kelly right now. So get on the email or Twitter, and so so I will track what you ask. Um, what one of one of you know we know that China has been investing quite heavily on the Belt and Road Initiative into coal. Um, do you think? I don't know. I mean, do you think with the U.S. coming in that there could be that kind of pressure competition to kind of help China leap out, you know, green their Belt and Road as as Xi Jinping mm -hmm. keeps talking about? Yeah, well, the rhetoric in China about greening the Belt and Road has been really good for some years now, but the action has not followed the rhetoric. Um, that being said, to, we should be clear that um, Chinese investments in overseas coal kind of, I think they peaked around um, 2014, 2015, and the investments have, have really plummeted in coal. And meanwhile, there have been, you know, increasingly new investments in renewables, a lot of investment in hydro, um, grid infrastructure, high-speed electric rail. So there's, you know, it, it just needs to be acknowledged. There's definitely some good stuff that's being financed through the Belt and Road, um, as well as the coal. But China has refused so far and really now is, is the last country, the last holdout um, refused to halt uh, its, its investments in overseas coal. Because um, Obama did that, right? He's, he's the one who stopped us from- investing Yes, under the overseas. Obama administration, there was a, an executive order that, that just prohibited US investments through any of our multilateral development banks or through USAID um, mm -hmm. to support coal. Initially, there was like a little, in, unless there was nothing else available yeah. sort of caveat. Um, but in fact, you know, all the multilateral development banks 
And by the way, including the China dominated Asian yeah. Infrastructure Investment Bank have halted um, their overseas investments in coal. So really we're just looking at um, commercial banks, uh, which you know the governments don't control. And then the Chinese policy banks, the China, China Development Bank and the China XM Bank. Um, I think uh, there's tremendous potential for the two countries to cooperate um, in greening overseas development finance and greening overseas development aid. Actually, those are two different things, right? The aid, like uh, one of the announcements at the, at the leader summit was that USAID was developing a new climate strategy and it would announce that climate strategy ahead of COP26 uh, in November. Um, and you know, China has a new aid agency, and I think it could um, cooperate with USAID on delivering climate aid uh, in, in developing countries. But really where, the, where there's tremendous potential and an urgent need is the overseas development finance, because that's really where the power plants are getting built and the, you know, uh, rail lines are being built, all the infrastructure. And the U.S. just hasn't been a, a, a player. It just hasn't had anything on offer. And so I think this is, there's a lot of potential. Um, and I think the fact that it was mentioned as a potential area of cooperation in the recent joint statement um, indicates that it's on the table for discussion now. Well, one thing that, that that came to my mind, and maybe it seems a bit obscure, but um, knowing that that a big part of the Belt and Road Initiative is building ports, mm -hmm. and I know uh, I don't know if everyone listening is familiar, but China actually a, a few years a few years ago, around 2015 or so, started a green port initiative in China, where because it was mainly focused on air pollution, because I think one year 2014 in Shanghai you couldn't, there was so much smog, you had they had to bring boats in by satellite. So, because ports, you know, with the diesel, they they pull, they're highly polluting. But it also, besides, you know, conventional air pollutants, there's also carbon emissions. And Chinese and U.S. ports like Shanghai and Port of L.A. have been working. They they worked together even before the Obama administration. It became yeah. part of the clean. Port. And and there was a port initiative as part of the U.S. China Climate Change Working right. Group. Right. Yes. And so I'm wondering if that might be kind of an interesting area because because that's the kind of example where it's, it's not just technology, but it's, I mean, obviously there's some technology, but also how the port is managed, re policies requiring boats to, to, to plug in when they get into port. And I mean, do you think that could, I mean, but I guess- Yes, but how, I, how you're getting at a really that? important issue, which is that it's not just that the, the finance needs to be available for these you know, low carbon technologies, but also that the, what we call enabling policy environment is in place in each of these developing countries. And this is so important because it, um, there is agency on the part of the developing countries, right? They are the ones approaching China and saying, hello, would you like to finance this new power plant for me? And if they're asking for a coal plant, China's providing them with a coal plant. But if they're asking for a wind farm, China's also willing to provide that wind farm and to fi finance it. So it's very important that the recipient countries get the policies in place to put them themselves on a low carbon growth trajectory. And that there's an, also an important role for both the US and China to help those countries with that climate change policy environment, climate change strategy, uh, low carbon growth strategy, so that they uh, have a clear plan for how they can grow their economies without growing their emissions. And that does have the, the kind of advantage, well, not advantage, but does that it's, 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 it's not heavy financing going into these countries, but, but do you, and so do you think, and that, well, that both. Seems, I'm, I'm arguing both are needed, both, that both we needed. can't, it's not just finance, but also that kind of um, uh, support and capacity building on mm -hmm. the, the, the governance system that you need to have in place uh, for climate policy. Well, um, what do you think? We just have a few more minutes here, but of, of in the in the statement because they listed other areas. Do you see other areas that that the two countries can maybe kind of come together on? I mean, it's, it's it's we're not like it was back in the Obama administration where it was like this crazy ping pong match of exchanges and conversations. Well, I love your idea of parallel play um, because <laughs> I think it isn't actually important at this juncture for the United States and China to directly be cooperating 
What's more important is that both countries are on a on an ambitious trajectory, you know, independent of each other. And that will motivate many other countries to follow suit. Um, and because the US and China are the two biggest emitters, also it just increases confidence in the whole system. It increases confidence in the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. that if you have the two biggest emitters actually working to reduce their emissions. So, well, actually we could, you, instead of like thinking of toddlers, let's say Titans, right? Pull up your book there. Cause you, <laughs> her, Kel, just want to announce everyone that Kel, Kelly had a book she published right in the before times and Titans of, oh, right? Yeah, there we like, go. <laughs> Titans of the climate. And, uh, and it's being, it's coming out in Chinese very soon, right? Later this year. Yes. That's right. So, so parallel Titan toddlers. <laughs> the <laughs> so, mental so, image is very. Mental image is kind of good. But I mean, but, so, but that's what you can, can you just real quickly to close this out? So that, like climate titans. I mean, so we're the ones that are going to make it. We're going to make it happen. The U.S. and China. Well, or no not. two countries are more important than the U.S. and China today. Um, and they have, you know, an intrinsic responsibility as major emitters to reduce their own emissions. But I think both of them are also considered role model countries for, for many others. Many, many developing countries have looked to the United States for you know, an economic growth model, and many are now looking to China and China's, China's own development model. And we need to, to demonstrate that it is possible to reduce emissions and grow your economy um, because all countries wanna develop. But there's also probably going to be a big role um, for the the NGOs, the U.S., you know, the Natural Resource Defense Council, WRIs, and their Chinese counterparts to kind of maybe keep lighting the fire on the two countries or acting as watchdogs. What do you what do you think in that space? That is that. Yeah, the role of NGOs there? is just so totally different in the two countries, as you know well, Jennifer. Um, and one thing we talk a lot about in the Titans of the Climate book. Um, so the agency of the NGOs in China continues to be much more constrained than it is in the United States. Um, but nonetheless, uh, NGOs in China have played a really important role in um, raising awareness about the climate change problem. Um, and the expert community in China has been essential to informing and advising the government about what's possible in terms of um, climate policy. And I'm even wondering that maybe with the, the slightly better relationship that maybe there'll be, because there, ha there have been, I mean, it was even before COVID that by, you know, academics and NGOs were having a little bit tougher yes. time to working together. And I mean, do you feel like that's going to soften and be a little easier now? I think now more than ever, it's important to have the NGO to NGO, what we call people to people dialogues mm -hmm. and also expert exchanges um, because that's where we really you know begin to understand each other okay well great and so um so everyone you should buy her new book uh, and whatever next one you decide to write but um, i want to thank you for coming today kelly and and also let people know in terms of like people to people stuff i on on may 12th we have a meeting coming up on electric vehicles the race to the top um, where I've got some Chinese and U.S. folks talking. We talked earlier this week on energy efficiency building, energy efficient buildings in the U.S. and China. How again? I don't know. Buildings can't race, but there's also kind of a kind of a parallel activities happening there. But there can be exchanges of information. So it still could be happening. But again, thank you so much um, for coming to talk today, Kelly. And um, even if you didn't have tea, thank you so it's much. It's been a everyone. pleasure. Okay. Bye. Thank you.